This is 5 on 20 News, where the news is sometimes vile, but the newscasters are always vigilant. With Alex Kack. And Anias Quintella. Coming to you live from our studio in downtown Tucson. First, the local headlines. The Tucson economy is booming. Local war profiteers Raytheon Missile Systems expect to add nearly 2,000 jobs and potentially billions of dollars to the local economy over the next five years. Raytheon announced plans to expand their facilities on the south side of Tucson International Airport on Friday after securing tax breaks and incentives that could mean tens of millions of dollars for the company. Apparently, tens of billions of dollars in no-bid government contracts isn't enough to secure the f future of this fledging mom-and-pop. Sales of Raytheon death machines have been on the upswing as a result of the continual warfare being waged by the U.S. and allied forces. In a conference call on Friday, Raytheon's missile systems president, Taylor Lawrence, said, quote, The strong support we receive from state and local organizations is essential to our expansion plans and will keep, keep Raytheon with the workforce and infrastructure to meet the growing demand we are seeing from our customers. Lawrence then began to cackle menacingly for several minutes while stroking an evil-looking cat. Raytheon is already the largest private employer in our area with more than 10,000 local workers. The company is planning to hire workers at all skill levels with an emphasis on engineering and other technical positions. Governor Doug Ducey, who was also in on Friday's conference call, was quoted as saying, this is great news and just more proof that Southern Arizona's economy is on fire. Meanwhile, thanks in part to Raytheon's products, the country of Yemen is literally on fire. Vile business at that vile business. A federal judge has issued a preliminary injunction against the Border Patrol in Arizona. Tucson District Judge David C. Berry says detention facilities are not providing proper human needs and ordered that Tucson area detention centers allow detainees to take regular showers and to sleep in holding cells. He also said that the agency needed to provide clean bedding for those held for more than 12 hours and to ensure that sinks and toilets are working properly. The decision came as part of a class action suit filed against Border Patrol. The suit also claims cells were kept too cold and were overcrowded, causing sleep deprivation for some detainees. The American Immigration Council, the National Immigration Law Center, and the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights filed the class action suit. Judge Barry said that providing conditions that are worse than prison violates the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. Reportedly, some detainees were only provided a mat if no bedding was available and had to sleep in noisy cells where the lights were almost always turned on. Evidence provided by the court showed that only 115 out of 16,992 detainees were able to take showers from June 10th to September 28th, 2015. Judge Barry's injunction will remain in place as the class action lawsuit continues through 2017 when it faces a tough battle with the incoming Trump administration. Trump has repeatedly stated his intention to deport up to three million undocumented immigrants. Private prisons such as the GEO Group and Corrections Corporation of America, which are increasingly operating the detention centers, have seen their stocks soar since Trump's election. It seems like their business will be booming for the foreseeable future. Sounds like those holding cells are pretty vile. Arizona Game and Fish Department have killed a bear in Madera Canyon. <laughs> the 175-pound female black bear was marked for death after department officials labeled the creature a nuisance. Several hiking trails in Madera Canyon have been closed over the last few months after hikers reported a bear approaching them in a menacing manner. Arizona Game and Fish could have tranquilized and relocated the bear, but as department spokesman Mark Hart explained, nuisance bears, nuisance bears have the tendency to return to their habitat. Some hope this hard line of, on nuisance bears will discourage other bears from becoming nuisances themselves. The bear drew its last breath at approximately 4.30 p.m. yesterday and was found to be unarmed. Exact details of this event aren't clear as Arizona Game and Fish Department officials were not wearing body cameras at the time of the killing. Unbearably vile. Do you want to own a restaurant? Owners of the Outside Inn in Sierra Vista may be serving up your best opportunity to do so. Don and David Bain will be giving away their restaurant early next year to the winner of an essay contest. The couple opened the restaurant 23 years ago and have been successfully operating the business ever since. If you can sum up why you would like to operate your own restaurant in 200 words or less and raise the $125 required to enter, you could be operating one of Sierra Vista's favorite eateries. Sound too good to be true? Well, the catch is that the restaurant is in Sierra Vista. For more information and contest rules, visit the outside in blog.wordpress.com. 
And now in national and international news. Well-known con artist and president-elect Donald Trump has agreed to pay out $25 million to settle a series of lawsuits surrounding his bogus school. The now defunct Trump University hustle ran from 2004 to 2010. Unsuspecting marks were drawn in with free introductory seminars, which focused on real estate investing and Trump's secrets to success. After the initial free taste came the big pitch. Students were offered a series of more expensive curriculum packages with price tags as high as $35,000 a pop. Trump often touted the success of the program, claiming many people that took the course signed report cards saying it was fantastic, it was wonderful, it was beautiful. Roughly 7,000 lawyered up former students disagree with that sentiment, including Jeffrey Tefinkian, who referred to his experience as almost completely worthless. Former Trump University employees went on record calling the operation a fraudulent scheme. The seminars wildly overstated Donald Trump's involvement with the programs, claiming Trump picked the instructors with his own tiny hands, something he later acknowledged to be a lie. Like the practice swindler he is, Trump stood by his con throughout his presidential campaign. He warded off attacks from the likes of Marco, Marco Rubio, Megyn Kelly, and Hillary Clinton. He repeatedly called the lawsuits phony and claimed he couldn't wait to go to court. He even went as far as to call Judge Gonzalo Curiel a hater and claimed the Indiana-born Curiel was biased because of Trump's plan to build a border wall. With the Trump University fiasco settled, Donald can now focus on making America great again, as well as the other 75 active lawsuits still facing his companies. Speaking of that vile man, Donald Trump continues to drain the swamp to make room for the regressive monsters that roam the sewers beneath Capitol Hill. Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III, better known as Senator Jeff Sessions when he isn't wearing his hood, has been named Trump's top pick for Attorney General. The Alabama senator and former Justice Department prosecutor is a supporter of the president-elect's plan to crack down on undocumented immigrants and has referred to President Obama's stance on gay marriage as shameful, even going so far as to call for a federal ban. Sessions was up for a federal judge position in 1986 under the Reagan administration, but was found to be unfit for the position by the Senate Judiciary Committee after former colleagues accused Sessions of making a string of racist comments. He had allegedly called the prominent white lawyer a disgrace to his race for representing black clients. He referred to the ACLU and NAACP as communist-inspired and un-American for trying to force civil rights down the throats of people. And he referred to his former deputy, Thomas Figures, a black man, as boy, and advised him to be careful about what he said to white folks. He once joked that he thought the Ku Klux Klan was okay until he found out that they smoked pot. As Attorney General, Sessions would be responsible for upholding civil rights laws. Oh, brother, there is a chance that the same Senate committee that denied him federal judgeship 20 years ago could block him from that position. But given that he now has a seat on the committee alongside notable bigots Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham, we won't hold our breath. A group of vile people. Trump Tower was the place to be this weekend as the president-elect surrounded himself with cabinet position contenders, ushering them through like a Miss America pageant with slightly less bathroom peeping. On Sunday alone, Trump hosted New York Jersey Governor Chris Christie and former New York mayor and current raging psycho Rudy Giuliani. Kansas Secretary of State and immigrant Anti-immigrant warrior Chris Kobach also paid a visit to make sure that no undocumented workers had snuck into the meeting. But the biggest star of the weekend was former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, who was one of Tuffet's fiercest Republican critics. Trump convinced Romney to come by, saying that he just wanted to hang out and watch Luke Cage and do some, quote, bro stuff. Romney became suspicious and uncomfortable when Trump began peppering their conversation with questions about foreign policy. Trump then suggested they play a game called Signature, where a player wins by signing an agreement to become U.S. Secretary of State. Trump capped off the weekend by splitting up his visitors into teams and issuing them challenges, such as designing the best defense against education fraud and creating the perfect alibi for committing war crimes. One of Trump's potentials said the weekend was fun, but was confused when Trump would regularly address an unseen studio audience and continually um, interrupt the meeting to hear a word from their sponsors. Anything with Trump and Romney is 47% vile. Speaking of the past, remember Freedom Fries? Well, it looks like Americans aren't the only country trivial enough to get caught up in the politics of food naming. At a time of weakening relations between the United States and Russia, the Ruskies are planning a full-scale attack on coffee. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev lightheartedly suggested that ordering an Americano is politically incorrect and the name should be adjusted. 
Menus across the country have changed the name from Americano to Russiano. The name change has been spearheaded by Igor Bukrov, head of the Russian Restaurant Association. Other name changes have taken place across Russia, such as a Lynchburg Lemonade now being a Saratov Lemonade, and a Jack and Coke now being called a Squirrel and Moose. Anti-American sentiment has increased across Russia since the annexation of Crimea, which was condemned by the Obama administration, along with the continual bombing of Syria, where Russia has taken an increasing role. American chain Burger King followed the Russian charge, listing their coffee as a Russiano on their menu. Burger King also changed the name of their flagship sandwich, the Whopper, to the Yad, which is Russian for poison. Does that mean people in the U.S. should start calling white Russians white Americans? Because that would be vile. For the past few decades, the term Nazi has been bandied around a little too freely, and as a result, it's lost some of its actual meaning. Given the current political climate, it's time we all admit that our bosses, our gym teachers, and that guy on the message board who disagrees with our Doctor Who fan theories are not Nazis, unless they are a member of the alt-right. On Saturday, the National Policy Institute, an alt-right white nationalist think tank, hosted their annual conference in the Ronald Reagan Building in Washington, D.C. This year's theme was Become Who We Are. The event featured 11 hours of speeches and panel discussions covering topics such as Trump and being a man, Trump and the new white voter, and peaceful ethnic cleansing for a white homeland. If that's not Nazi enough for you, here's a picture from the event featuring a couple white dudes and Tila Tequila giving the Nazi salute. Whether the Singapore-born softcore porn star understands the concept of ethnic cleansing is another matter entirely. The event got even more Nazi when NPI president Richard B. Spencer took the stage. Members of the audience shouted, Hail victory, hail to the people, as Spencer denounced the mainstream media. He referred to journalists as soulless golems, which is an obvious reference to the Jewish fable about a rabbi bringing a clay giant to life to protect the Jews. He then resurrected the Nazi propaganda word Lugenpress, which is German for lying press. Spencer went on to declare the alt-right as the winner of the presidential election. He closed his speech with the line, we're the establishment now, a horrifying sentiment for anyone who isn't straight, white, and full of hate. I thought Tila Tequila was vile on MySpace. Vice President-elect Mike Pence attended a Hamilton performance and was given a polite talking to by the cast and a booing to by the audience. Brandon Victor Dixon, who plays Aaron Burr in the hit Broadway musical, acknowledged Pence's presence, told the audience there's nothing to boo here, and then said, quote, we have a message for you, sir, and we hope you will hear us out. We truly hope that this show has inspired you to uphold our American values and work on behalf of all of us. We truly thank you for sharing this wonderful American story told by a diverse group of men and women of different colors, creeds, and orientations. Now, does that sound reasonable to you? Well, it didn't sound reasonable to President-elect Donald Trump. He fired back on Twitter saying the Hamilton cast harassed Pence. Trump went on to say that the theater must always be a safe and special place. Does he mean free of freedom of speech? And how does this man think a theater full of people is a safe place, but a private pageant dressing room is not? Anyway, who really knew that the Donald was a passionate proponent of the arts? It's interesting. I thought he was just into the art of the deal. This was Alex Kack. And Anais Quintella. For 5 on 20 News. Next up, Anais interviews Violet Cassier Pirzade, the curator and director of Monsoon Collective. Hey guys, this is Anais Quintella for 5 on 20 News, and I'm here with, tonight with Violet Pirzade at Monsoon Collective. Last night we were here making some art, and tonight we decided to do the same thing, but we're going to add alcohol to the equation this time. So, cheers. cheers. And I'm going to talk to her a little, about, a little bit about who she is and what she's doing here. Um, so where are we exactly for anyone that's just been at home drinking PBRs, watching <laughs> reruns of House of Cards, and hasn't checked this out yet? Well, this is Monsoon Collective. We're in the heart of downtown at uh, Fifth and Broadway. And yeah. Cool. So what exactly is this building used for right now? Uh, right now, it is an art show, but in the past, it was uh, Kodak, uh, so mental health, yeah. and uh, Planned Parenthood. Where exactly did the idea come from for hosting an art collective here? Um, I dropped out of art school, and I was super bummed I didn't get a grad show. So 
I wanted to throw my own grad show. And that's how it started, just planning my own show. Um, my dad offered this space to me. He's like, oh, if you want to do a show, like, here you go, like, throw yourself an art show. And it turned out to be a 10,000 square foot building. So I gathered a lot of people, wrote a <laughs> business plan. So it started off as like a solo project, it sounds like. Um, yeah. How did you get other people involved with this? Um, I started inviting my friends, like people I've known from middle school and from like recent encounters mm -hmm. to recent encounters. Um, and everybody's been really down because this, I wanted to offer them complete artistic freedom. Like, what are you doing in your like, studio or what are you thinking about? We want to see it in a room. Yeah, we like to like meet and talk with each other and just like grow. You know, like yeah. this place just grew from an idea. Yeah. Just an idea, like so speaking a year of the and idea, a half ago. Why did you call it Monsoon Collective? <clears throat> oh, so monsoons, like growing up in Tucson, monsoons have been like my favorite. They're so very important to like the life mm -hmm. in the desert, and that's why I named it because it brought like new life, like a Monsoon brings new life, so we've brought new life to this space, and hopefully that continues elsewhere, <laughs> yeah. everywhere. Um, so what kind of things, besides just having like artists in these rooms, have you done with this space? Um, we like to host like workshops and... What kind of workshops so far? Um, so, so far we've had a zine workshop, cool. which is really successful and cool. <laughs> okay. And um, we hosted a benefit for Cushing Street Skate Park. Cool. And just in case no one's ever heard of that, which they should have, but yes, in case they haven't, they tell me a little bit about that. Uh, so Cushing Street Skate Park is a plan um, done by Caleb Gutierrez and his friends. And it, we've involved ourselves because Caleb is an artist at Monsoon. Like, he involved himself in Monsoon. He's a really, like, essential part of our community, mm -hmm. just as everyone is. Um, yeah. And he was the one that threw the benefit here. Cool. Yeah. And so he's pushing to have a skate park out on Cushing Street. Yes, right? Cushing Street. It's this. It, it it'll be like a s skated, shaded, um, skate park. Shaded. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's so hard to say. A shaded skate park. A little bit of a tongue twister for sure. Yeah, it is. And. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh shit. Um. So besides <laughs> Caleb. <laughs> Besides Caleb, who are some other artists that you're featuring here? Um, so we have Michael B. Schwartz, who is a really big part of our community. Um, he does a lot of like youth education and community work, community activism. Yeah. He's done a lot of like um, the Tucson Your Own program mm -hmm. that was went up this summer. He directed that. Mm -hmm. um, and what else? He has murals all like all over Tucson. Cool. Yeah. Just projects done like with the community and stuff. When you open the second half of Monsoon, what's gonna? When are you opening that? Um, next Saturday or this Saturday because it's Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> it's confusing. Saturdays. So you're wrong. opening it. You're opening the next half of Monsoon on November 26th, 26th correct? 26th, November 26th, yes. 8 p.m.? Mm -hmm. And what do you think is going to happen that night? We have a DJ, um, two DJs actually. They're called Beer Money. It's Ben Lucero and, and um, Jeff Del Rey. Cool. El Rey, not Ooh. Del Rey. Just... Your rolling of the R's is super <laughs> solid. Ooh, thanks. <laughs> White people are I like to say it with impressed, his, yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah, and there we're doing another 3,000 square feet with six artists in uh, like 11 more installations. Mm -hmm. It'll be fun. Cool. How did you develop your artist style, would you say? Um, I, I think it's really explorative. Mm -hmm. Like this, anybody can do. It's just allowing yourself to do it. And so what are we doing right now, by the way, if just in case? You know, so this knows. is a little technique I came up with. It in, in, involves um, like symmetry and... Um, like ink blot it was tests, inspired, right? yeah, it was inspired by Rorschach's mm -hmm. ink blot tests, mm -hmm. which are like a, what's the word, psychological test. Mm -hmm. So this is really more of like, it, it is a psychological test slash experiment mm -hmm. slash expression. Um, so what's the future of Mon Monsoon Collective? <laughs> Okay. My goon. <laughs> um, so what's the future of Monsoon Collective or what's the future of you as an artist? What are some other things you're hoping to do? Um, personally, I always hope to like grow. I just mm -hmm. want to... I think be, we all do. I'll That's be like, fair. Yeah. Yeah. grow old and like yeah. be like a decrepit old artist. Be like, just like with <laughs> arthritis, like trying to paint shit. Like, yeah. yeah, just like dying and like <laughs> making art. <laughs> And then um, with Monsoon, it's it's such an ephemeral space. Like I want to be able to do as much as we can in the short amount of time that we have here. So we have the extension opening this weekend. We're going to be closing um, New Year's Eve, December 31st. It's that's the great. End. No, that's you've extended the date like multiple times at this point. So I'm just happy it's open. But you said you're going to be doing yoga as well. Yeah, we're going to have yoga with Rosie every Thursday at 5.30. Cool. Mm -hmm. You're awesome. <laughs> <gasps> it happened. It's okay. Close. This has been Ani Esquintella and Violet Casper Peters today with 5 on 20 News, making some art, doing some art talk, and we'll see you here for the opening of the second half of Monsoon Collective. Have a good one. This was 5 on 20 News. Thanks for watching. Happy Monday and stay vile, Tucson.